Okay, so I'm back and we're going to continue talking about universal intro and um, this is the very last uh, video in prep for problem set nine. By the way, um, we did have a, a meeting with a few people just now, but um, most people hadn't seen the videos and certainly hadn't seen this one. So I decided to hold an office hour sort of informally for the rest of the afternoon once this is posted. So I'm in my meeting room and you can stop by and chat uh, on Zoom at the usual ID, my personal meeting number. Okay, so um, let's go back and think about what was going on with universal intro. Um, so we're trying to prove that everything has the property P. Um, now it might be a good idea to just make this a bit more specific. So I'm gonna just copy that and um, oops. Um, make a specific predicate like, you know, cube, all right? And so if I want to prove that everything's a cube, all I have to do is prove that A is a cube. And that just seems like cheating, uh, as I think I was just saying at the end of the last video. Um, just because one thing, A, is a cube, that doesn't show that everything is. They call that um, a hasty generalization or, or something like that, right? So why would it be okay in this case when it's not normally okay? Well, it makes a big difference that this constant here, in a sense, has no particular meaning has no meaning sort of outside of the subproof. In fact, it's not even allowed to occur outside of the subproof. It's not allowed to occur in the premises uh, or in the conclusion or anywhere else, um, not in the subproof. So one way you can think about A is that it's um, kind of an unknown member of the world or the domain of quantification. Um, the only thing while you're in the subproof, the only thing you know about A is it's in the world. So um, that's a very limited uh, piece of information. One way of thinking about A is to um, imagine it like this. So suppose the world is sitting there, but you can't really see what's in the world because um, you're blindfolded, let's say. And you've got a dart and you write the name A on the dart. Actually, I was gonna stop the video, wasn't I? Um, you write the name A on the dart, and you know while you're blindfolded, you throw the dart into the world, and you hear it stick into something. You hear a little ouch, so you know that you hit something. And you say, okay, whatever I hit, that's A. That's what I'm calling A. Um, so you don't know whether A is a cube or, or not, uh, or large or small or anything. Um, so in that very special situation, if you can prove that A is a cube, that must mean that the premises, which obviously aren't shown here, the premises give you enough information that um, you could prove that A is a cube without any specific knowledge about the object that is A. Um, but when you think about that, you can maybe see why um, you could only succeed in that proof if everything's a cube. Um, and that's why it's actually legitimate to um, come outside the subproof then and write down that everything's a cube. If that makes sense. It's all about uh, restriction of information. If, you know, even with restricted information, so you have no information about A beyond its being a member of the world, you can prove that it's a cube, that must mean that everything is a cube. Okay, well, let's do an example. Often examples are better than uh, theoretical. <laughs> explanations. Okay, so here's an argument and uh, let's just see if it's valid first of all. Um, it says every cube is small. That's the first premise. Okay, second premise, everything is a cube. Hmm. Well, if the world is all cubes and all cubes are small, then obviously everything in the world is small. It would have to be that way. So it is, um, it is a logical con. Oops, simple con here, that's cool. I still am. Uh, it's all Greek to me. 
um, it is a logical consequence and, and it's actually um, more importantly it's so f o con okay so we can prove it all right now um hmm what do we do here now you might be saying hey i've got two universals to eliminate i'm just going to go ahead and eliminate those um and certainly you can eliminate them but it's actually a bad idea to do that first and that's what this um this banner here is about if you're trying to do a universal intro and also with an existential alarm that we haven't looked at yet, you've got to plan ahead, which apparently I didn't do here. You've got to plan ahead, and that means you've got to create the subproof you need, the universal intro subproof, before you do anything else. It's a priority. You've got to get on top of that. Um, I've, I've made various comparisons to this over the years. Um, one thing is that um, you know maybe you're working and you notice that the books on your shelf are not in the correct order. You know, and you think, boy, I've got to stop my homework now and um, rearrange those books on the shelf so that they're properly, um, you know, grouped, you know, the novels here and the, you know, the history books there and so on. Um, but really that's not a priority. You could sort of leave that till later. On the other hand, if, uh, if you're working and you, you start to smell smoke and you, Hook your head outside the door and you see that the house is you know on fire you don't say hmm i'll just deal with that later i'll just finish my assignment first no you know that's that's something pretty urgent that you've got to um you've got to sort out okay so you can think of the universal limb as like arranging the books on your shelf it's it's easy to do um it's kind of fun but it's not a priority whereas the um the universal to introduce is more like a house on fire. You know, you can't just leave that till later. You've got to get right on it. So um, we're going to create a subproof that looks a bit like this. Okay. Um, we have to have a box constant. Um, now I was thinking about how to box it. I think the best thing I can think of is just to do that. Let's see, somebody is here. Who is here? Um, hello? Oh, Dina, sorry, I'm just finishing my uh, video here. Feel free to um, just to listen if you want uh, or watch, but um, yeah, I'm doing my video. Okay. Um, a few more minutes. So I just box my constant there, and then I have to get, what do I have to get in the subproof here? Um, well, with the universal intro, the last line of the subproof is the same as your goal, but without the universal on it. So I'll just put this part up there. Um, small x. Ah, but there's one more change that the x has to turn into the constant. A here. So I'll put uh, small a. Okay. So now I'm set. I've, I've prepared um, to introduce the universal. Okay, so um, now, now I can go ahead and rearrange those books. Okay, um, cube A, I'm going to eliminate the universal at line one, put X equal to A. I mean, of course, you could put X equal to B, but um, since we have to prove small a, it's uh, a much better idea to put x equal to a. Okay. Um, all right, so that's universal, oops, universal OM on line one. And I guess we may as well do line two as well and also um, put x equal to a. Generally, if there's already a constant in the proof, that's the one you're going to pick. Um, also notice that I can use A as many times as I like. Um, it's not like A is sort of used up. If it's true for all X, then it's got to be true for A. Um, universal M from line two. Okay. Um, how do we get small A? 
Well, that's just a conditional limb. Hopefully you remember the rules from the midterm, four and five, problem set six. Um, and now having reached the goal within the universal intro subproof, I can just introduce the universal. And the, uh, the line numbers I cited, just the subproof, three to six. There we go. Um, I don't know if that seems to make sense. At least in this case, the conclusion does follow. Um, so universal intro hasn't enabled us to prove something that doesn't even hold. Um, and again, you know, I could have put any letter here at all, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, et cetera, and it would have looked exactly the same. Um, there's nothing sort of special about A because it's um, confined. It's in jail inside the subproof. All right, let's maybe do one more here of universal intro. Um, hmm, now this one is supposed to be an example of universal intro, but I don't see any universal that introduce. Well, maybe one will appear. Um, let's look at that premise first. Maybe we could try to eliminate that. But note that it's not a universal, it's a negation. Um, and you might want to say, hmm, based on that, you know, uh, negation uh, cube A or something, um, universal a limb. But that can't be right because it's not a universal. It's not going to be formally correct. But also, it doesn't even follow, does it? Um, the premise says that not everything is a cube. Well, if not everything's a cube, it doesn't mean that A isn't. I mean, A could actually be a cube, uh, but, but something else like B is not a cube. So it's sort of doubly wrong there. Um, can't um, treat line one as universal at all. Um, well, if that doesn't work, then you might think, let's look at the conclusion. How do we um, introduce a negation? Is there a rule for proving negations? Well, of course there is a negation intro. So let's um, set up for that. Um, that means we have to assume this part, part inside the negation. Okay, and underline some of that. Um, have some more lines. If you notice that I somehow know the exact length of these proofs, because I did this a few minutes ago and uh, forgot to record it, so <laughs> take two. Um, where does this end, the subproof? Well, it ends with anti, of course. Um, now, if you, if you can't do the anti symbol, one thing I just realized you could do is you could do one of these lines, but then you could uh, control U it, underline it. So, I mean, it's not quite as good, but that's pretty good. Um, there's probably other things you could do as well. Okay, so this will be a negation intro from line two. Actually, I know that it's going to be line, to, line seven, so I'll cheat. All right. Now, hmm. Now you might think, well, I can go ahead and eliminate line two because that is a universal. I could say, you know, cube A and small a or something. Um, but actually, I mean, you could, but that's not going to be uh, the best thing. It's better to think about at the moment how you can use this, particularly as we now have a contradiction here. Basically, this is one of these sentences where you have to use the crystal ball. Um, so in our future, I'll put it in my crystal ball here, we, we see a contradiction in our future and uh, to get the contradiction, we're going to have to use line one, of course, together with, um, oops, uh, for all x cube x. 
Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, this is probably the contradiction. So it might be a good idea just to put that in. We'll see in a moment why that is in fact useful. Um, yeah, I kind of know already I'm going to have to prove that everything's a cube. You should also check that it does follow. I mean, given that everything is a cube and small, does it follow that everything's a cube? Well, clearly it does. Okay, so at least I'm not trying to do anything impossible here. That seems to be a sound plan. All right. So, yeah, it turns out that this is a universal intro example after all, because I have to prove line six. And now I have line six, it's clear that I can't just go ahead right away and eliminate the universal line two, because again, that's like rearranging books on the shelf while the house is on fire. Um, you can leave that till later and take care of introducing line six. So that's, oops, that's why we need to um, have another sub proof. And uh, what does universal intro look like again? Um, box a constant and then have the uh, the woof inside the universal with a constant. Okay, so we need to box a constant which we have, um, I don't know, E, let's say, um, underline that. And then the last line will be cube. In other words, we'll take the universal off, cube x, but then put x equal to the constant e. Oh, shoot, e is another bad one. Let me try b. Okay, let's get rid of these shortcuts. Um, all right, so now I just have to prove that b is a cube from the fact that um, everything is a small cube. It shouldn't be too hard. Now, finally, we can eliminate the universal Okay, get rid of the universal quantifier and then put x equal to anything you like. B here seems to be the right choice. Um, okay, so seem to be done. Let's make that uh, universal limb on uh, line two. That's and a limb from line four. And this is universal intro three to five. This is anti intro on. Uh, one and six. Okay. Um, well, that's getting a little bit more complicated. Um, that looks a bit more like one on the final exam. Um, you know, slightly easier one. Anyway, um, again, the, the main thing is that once you see a universal as something you need to prove, you don't sort of think, oh, I'll do it later. Let me do some other stuff first. Got to get right on it. Okay, make that subproof, box a constant, put it in the last line, and so on. Okay. All right. So our final rule then uh, is existential LM. And again, I've written it out here in advance. Um, now, one way to think about this is it is a bit like or LM, and you can see that at the end how. Um, uh, whatever your goal is, some sentence S uh, that you want to prove from the existential, um, that's also the last line of your subproof. So we're going to do the trick as before of uh, stuffing the rabbit into the hat before the start of the show. So that at the, the, the climax of the show, we can pull it out um, to, to great applause. Um, and the assumptions though that, I mean, if there's only a single subproof, that's, that's a big difference between existential LM and or LM. Um, in a way, we're going through all the possibilities in just one go, 
in a single subproof, um, which is kind of clever. Um, all right, so the premise here that there is something with the property P um, kind of allows us to say, well, let's just give that thing or one of those things a name. You know, if you know that there's at least one cube, you know, you could just say, let A be an arbitrary cube, right? Or, you know, either a name for the cube or if there's more than one, just, um, just let it fall on a random cube. You can think about the dart again. Suppose you have a special dart that uh, will target uh, a certain type of thing, whatever the um, property P is here, if that's cube or TED or whatever. Um, it'll stick into just a random cube. So uh, with this assumption, all you know about the object A is that it has P, nothing more, okay? So the idea here is that if from such a, a small amount of knowledge, you manage to prove S, um, S must be true, okay? Because um, you're not making, assuming you've got some particular cube, you know, when a special one, like a small one, or one that is back of B or anything like that, if you're just assuming that it's a cube, then um, whatever you prove from that must be true no matter which one you happen to pick. Um, anyway, again, it's, it's perhaps easier to see how it works with an example, okay? And the example I have here is probably the simplest one that's possible, just about. Um, my premise is that, uh, there is a large tet, and from that, I'm going to prove that there is a tet. Okay, pretty straightforward. So, um, going back to this banner up here, existential limb is like universal intro, but it's not something to delay or to put off till later. You've got to get on it right away um, and create that subproof. So, that's what I'm going to do. Um, Make some lines and the assumption line. I need what do I need a constant? Um, hit B, and then I need to um, take the woof inside the existential and just replace the constant, uh, sorry, the variable there, x, with the constant that I've just boxed. So this is kind of saying, we know that there are large tets, one or more large tets in the world from premise one. So just let, let B be one of those large tets. Um, now I know in math class, sometimes they use the word suppose here. You know, suppose X is the number of eggs or something like that. But the trouble there is that, you know, a hand will go up at the back of the room. I, I know because I used to be a math teacher. Someone will say, but suppose it isn't, sir. Suppose X isn't the number of X. I'm thinking, no, 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 you don't understand. We're just uh, assigning a kind of a random label to a, something we know exists. We know that there is some large, some, some number of X, uh, or that we know that there's some large tet. And we're just sort of assigning this arbitrary label, sort of dummy label B to um, a random large tet. Okay. Um, and the last line, what is the last line? S, whatever we're trying to pull out. So yeah, this is the stuffing the rabbit in the hat trick we're doing there. The rabbit is stuffed, ready to pull out at the end. As soon as I get to line five, I can immediately pull it out, line six. In fact, just so I don't forget what I'm doing, I'm gonna write X extension of limb right away. Um, it's from line one and the subproof, which actually I know is going to be two till five. I already did it. <clears throat> okay. Um, so now we're set up. We just have to prove that there is a tet from the knowledge that B is large and B is a tet. Well, um, yeah, I guess we can say large B um, from and a limb from line two. Now, many of you have probably noticed we don't actually need line three, but uh, it's not, it's not going to hurt to put it there. And then we get tech B from and a limb 
and two. And so then, um, given that B is a tet, something must be by um, existential intro oops, from uh, line four. And so that's done. Yeah, that's the basic trick to existential limb. Um, and hopefully this will seem valid. Um, I mean, you can sort of see that in the way we derived line five, it didn't matter what we called this large tet. If we called it C or D or A or F, G, it would work exactly the same way. So um, from that, it might seem reasonable to be able to pull that conclusion out um, so that it holds in reality, not just subject to the large tet being B or one of them being B. Um, okay, so to finish here, um, you might be wondering, why do we need such strict rules about um, not bringing things out, uh, sorry, not bringing out the boxed constant? Why does that constant uh, have to stay inside the subproof? Um, so here's an example where I'm going to bring the box constant outside the subproof and but in doing so prove something that doesn't follow. I'm going to prove that Trudeau is an idiot. Now, I'm not saying that he isn't, he might be. Um, but the point is that it doesn't follow from my assumption here. I'm just assuming that um, there is an idiot in the world. Obviously from that, it doesn't follow that Trudeau is an idiot. It could be all other kinds of people who are idiots, not necessarily Trudeau. So um, anyway, let's, let's see how I could prove this if we were allowed to bring you know, B or whatever the letter is outside the subproof. Okay, so let's start. First of all, I'm going to say, um, oops, and it wants to correct me there. Um, I know that there's an idiot. Let's just think of some random label um, for one of the idiots. And so let's, you know, just arbitrarily pick Trudeau, the name Trudeau for being the name of an idiot. Um, now there's nothing wrong with this so far because notice that um, Trudeau is a fresh name. It doesn't appear anywhere in the premise or anywhere above in the proof. So I haven't actually done anything wrong yet. Um, but of course, I don't really need to reiterate here, but just to make it clear, I'll, I'll reiterate sentence so that it's not stuck behind this um, boxed constant there. Um, let's make that read from line two. Um, and now, um, if I'm allowed to pull this out by existential limb, existential limb on uh, two to three, oh, and the existential at line one, um, if I'm allowed to pull that out, then I yeah, apparently have given a formal proof that Trudeau is an idiot from a fairly uh, uncontroversial premise. So it's obviously something wrong here. And um, the problem is that, you know, if you, if you make uh, the name Trudeau just a dummy label, you can't then bring it out of the subproof. Um, now there's another one here that shows that in a similar way, you need to, um, Let's pick a fresh name. Notice in this proof, I'm not going to pull out the name Trudeau. It's only going to, um, uh, it's going to be kind of gotten rid of before I pull anything out, but it still is not fresh in this case. And um, for rather similar reasons as, as this proof being wrong, um, this proof is also incorrect. And, and clearly it doesn't follow. If I say somebody is an idiot, and the second premise, if Trudeau is an idiot, then Canada is in trouble. It just doesn't follow that Canada is in trouble because you know, uh, you know, the fact that somebody is an idiot doesn't mean that Trudeau is right. So um, this doesn't follow. But if I'm allowed to use non-fresh constants in my existential limb, then I could give a formal proof. 
All right. Well, I think that's enough for you to do the rather simple proofs on problem set nine. Um, but I will be sitting here in my office this afternoon and again tomorrow afternoon at 2.30. So uh, hopefully if you do have any questions, you'll get a chance to drop by and uh, ask me about it. Okay, I'll sign off here.